Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to greet you in the second panel of the third Kharkiv International Security Forum, which is traditionally called Fight for Minds in the Time of Hybrid War. And we are starting the second panel, which is uh, dedicated to the chances of Ukraine to acquire full membership of uh, NATO. We have esteemed speakers who will be sharing their opinions on that topic. And I'm asking them to pr briefly present themselves, please starting from Yulia. Uh, hello, dear colleagues, uh, our organizers and uh, participants of our uh, event. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to be here because it's uh, really uh, traditionally a very important forum. I'm Laputina Julia, General Major uh, in Reserve of the Security Service of Ukraine and now director of the Directorate uh, of uh, Communication <coughs> of the Ministry of Reintegration of uh, Temporary Occupied Territories of Ukraine. Thanks. <laughs> okay, well, I will go next. Um, I, I'm, I'm Glenn Grant. I am a former British Army officer of 37 years service. And currently I work with the Ukrainian Institute for the Future as their uh, defense and security advisor. And also, uh, as part of that work, I work with the um, uh, Defence and Security Committee in Parliament, in the RADA, uh, as, a, as a supporter for them uh, with making, uh, changing the security laws. Um, and I've been working in and around Ukraine since the war started, when I was invited there to the Ministry of Defence as, a, as a, an advisor. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Yulia. Uh, I'll go next. My name is George Von Klan. I'm unique here in that I'm a private citizen. I don't actually work formally for any organization. I don't, I'm not being paid, um, but I may be able to provide some interesting viewpoints. In any event, Natalia thought that I could because we've had many discussions. Uh, I first visited Ukraine in 2011. I visited Ukraine approximately 30 times. Um, I have many good friends in Ukraine, and many people have asked me if I'm Ukrainian. The answer of Ukrainian heritage, I'm not, but my father's from Czechoslovakia, my mother from Chile, and my family were victims uh, in the most severe ways of both Nazis and communists in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, I was born in a, a multilingual household in New York City. Uh, I've lived around the world. Uh, I've been educated in different countries, uh, in public, private, and Catholic schools, and now I live in California father of four, grandfather of two. My main work uh, professionally is as a lift uh, engineer and innovator. I'm in the elevator industry for 33 years. Um, <clears throat> the uh, things that I say today and anything I've done in Ukraine is just my own, uh, they're of my own independent thinking. Uh, I basically am responsible for what I do and what I say. I wanna say thank you to both of the folks that are here, Glenn and Yulia, for what they do professionally and just also to say to the people listening, to many thousands of other people, professional and volunteers and war fighters uh, that were in this together. And I'm honored to be part of that shared effort. And also to thank you to our host, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Uh, and I don't see our, our panelists from Georgia here, but I was going to mention that I think some of the comments that we'll say today will probably also apply to Georgia as well. And uh, just so that you understand where I'm coming from, since I'm not professionally known, I tend to align my views with people like uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Churchill, McCain, uh, Angela Merkel, and maybe Jim Mattis, and for U.S. domestic policy, more towards Sanders and Obama. And that's, that's my introduction. Thank you. Iraqli, uh, your floor, please. But just turn on your microphone. Uh, Mm -hmm. yes, okay. uh, thank you. My name is Irakli Adwadze. Uh, since uh, 2011, uh, until uh, the August of this year, I worked for the consulate of Georgia in Donetsk. So I was uh, in Donetsk uh, uh, in 2014 uh, when uh, war was started. Now I'm working uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs 
as a senior uh, counselor. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so uh, I see that George dropped out again, but we hope that he will be uh, back with us. And I am giving floor to Julia for her uh, opinions about Ukraine, NATO, and whatever you want to tell us. Please, you. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, my first uh, acquaintance with NATO began in 2006-2008, approximately. Uh, for Ukraine-NATO relations, this was a period of open-door policy, and it continued with the submission in January uh, 2008 of Ukrainians' application to join membership action plan. Uh, at that time, the uh, Ukrainian Minister of Defense actively began, co uh, began cooperation uh, with the alliance in military sphere. Uh, we, as security service of Ukraine, were the first time involved together with MOD representatives in roundtables and trainings uh, that provided information about goals of NATO or partnership uh, and the process of planning and assessing forces. And uh, at the time, I was an officer of um, Alpha Counter Terrorist Unit. If we analyze how uh, security services of Ukraine can join uh, the cooperation with NATO, uh, because member countries have a different model of the security uh, sector. And in consultation with the representatives from Alliance, we have for the first time identified in those time in 2000, maybe uh, eight, the specific partnership of objective for security service, which were to achieve interoperability between member state counter-terrorist units and Ukrainian units, as well as to introduce um, language training courses for counter-terrorist staff. The experience, first experience um, of this, uh, achieving these goals was successful and we were optimistic about Ukrainians' uh, next steps towards the, uh, joining NATO. It has uh, become clear for, to us that NATO has implemented a different model of military and security governance than the post-Soviet space, based on the values of a democratic world. And, uh, but then came the turbulent times of our history, and in 2010, Yanukovych's decision was to liquidate the Commission for Cooperation with Alliance. Uh, the revolution of dignity gave a clear signal to the world about the aspirations of Ukrainian people to European and Euro-Atlantic uh, values. And Russia's military invasions of Ukraine uh, to Ukraine, the occupation of Crimean Peninsula, testified to the vital uh, need for Ukraine to join powerful international security systems. At the same time, we observed that European countries, including members uh, of alliance, uh, were often expressed deep concern about Russia's military ag actions against Ukraine. Uh, at various sites, talk about the need to counter hybrid threats, uh, hostile propaganda, and so on. At the same time, they don't want to actively support Ukraine in the de facto geopolitical confrontation of European civilization with the so-called Russian world, the goal of which is to, uh, uh, to, to catch all of the Euro-Atlantic space. Among the threats of Russian security, which defined in the Russian military doctrine, state, uh, state doctrine, uh, is the desire to endow NATO with global functions to bring the information structure of NATO member countries closer to the borders with Russia. Article 15 of the National Security Strategy of Russian Federation show that increasing NATO force potential in drawing uh, it with global functions implemented in violation of international law uh, and intensifying the military activities of member countries pose a threat to Russia's national security. Under NATO, uh, Russian's law, Russian law, NATO expansion to the east by admitting new members opposes the military political threat to Russia. At the same time, it is somewhat surprising that myth, which is officially debunked, can still be found on the website of the NATO mission in Ukraine, myth. Uh, the quote is, cooperation with NATO will ruin uh, relations with Russia. It argues that Russia had borders with the member countries 
before Ukraine began cooperating with, with NATO, since the beginning of Russia's cooperation <clears throat> with alliance, relations with uh, these countries have only improved. It's really nonsense, but it still exists in the website of uh, Ukrainian, uh, of the mission of NATO in Ukraine. Um, very indicative uh, in, uh, is the draft of Russian long-term national security strategy prepared by the Center of Military and Political Studies of Moscow Institute of International Relations. The clash of local civilization has begun. It is a quote of uh, this uh, Russian uh, strategy. The clash of um, local civilizations has begun. The West wants to conquer others. The supply of Western weapons to Ukraine is the fact military participation in civilizational conflict. Today is no clear line between politics and war. All the attributes of war exist during the peace political process when the partners negotiate and continue cooperation. Russia is helping the resistance in Donbass, it calls, they call it resistance in Donbass, uh, while providing loans of, to Kiev and not stopping gas supplies. These are the most probable scenarios of the global confrontation with uh, Western civilization and Russia. So we should understand that Russia identify itself in the status of war with Western world and with uh, United States of America. So when we're speaking about Russian cooperation with NATO, it should be clear for us that it is only imitation. Uh, one more example. Uh, yeah, I, I will be in brief. Uh, how Russians <clears throat> understand the role of uh, new members of NATO uh, in the future global processes. Bulgaria, uh, Bul Bulgaria Slovakia, Slovakia, Hungary, Greece, Macedonia, Montenegro, even if there is no, reori no reorientation these countries to the West, the West must be forced to spend more money of maintaining loyalty to the alliance. Uh, neutralizing Turkey's potential could dramatically change the situation in Mediterranean uh, territories. The current situation in Syria allows this to be done. Intensifying the Kurdish liberation struggle will require significant efforts by Turkey and we, we weaken its position as NATO's main force in the regions. So this course of the strategic document of Russian federations show, Federation show us uh, that uh, Russia really positioned itself uh, as a global uh, player uh, in geopolitical in, in new geopolitical um, order in the world. So if if we, we can see that uh, Russian Federation try to uh, have diplomatical dialogue with alliance with somebody else, we should understand that it's also element of this geopolitical uh, hybrid uh, war and uh, they will do everything not to involve um, countries, uh, member states uh, to um, support Ukrainian uh, position and to support Ukraine in our also geopolitical, uh, uh, geopolitical counteraction for uh, today's. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. And who's next? Who wants to be the, the next? The uh, I'll defer to uh, one of the other panelists, uh, Glenn. Or the other okay. I'll, uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for that, Yulia, for, for starting us off. And and I, I think that you, you you've made a you, you've made a, a sort of a good point there at the end about about the sort of the hybrid warfare part and the fact that that Russia will want to stop. NATO join, sorry, NATO, that Ukraine joining NATO, uh, and, and will do everything uh, she can to do that. Um, if one looks at it generally, then, then, then within NATO, you've got culturally different groupings. Uh, and I think that that's important for, for Ukrainians to understand. I mean, there, there is the Western grouping, and I'll come back to that, which is uh, of UK, US, France. Um, and then you've got a, a, a sort of the, 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 the middle Europe grouping, um, which fears Russia, but is far enough away not to worry too much about it. And then you've got the former Eastern, uh, the, the former Eastern Europe 
people who never, ever want to go back to Russia, but who Russia is fighting hard politically by use of money and largesse to pull them back. <clears throat> um, Hungary being a prime example, Czech Republic, sometimes Slovakia, sometimes not. Um, and, and almost in, 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 in many of these countries, you've then got this split and you've got this split in Ukraine where you've got the government on one hand, um, which Russia is trying hard to pull towards back towards Russia. You've got the, the anti-people uh, who are anti-NATO, uh, often for no sound reason other than they think it costs too much or that they think that, that it, it brings Russia towards them by being in NATO. And then you've got the civil society who want to join NATO and want the protection and also see that NATO bit as being the Western, uh, the Western leaning, which they want to be. Um, and Ukraine, Ukraine has got a particular problem I see at the moment with this, because if you look at the government, it, you, within the government, you've got a real mess at the moment. And it is a mess. I mean, it's, it's, it's not only is it a mess, it's almost impossible to see through. It reminds me um, of a kaleidoscope where every day you turn the kaleidoscope and you see the same colours, but the picture's different. Um, and it's quite impossible. You know it, there's red in there, but you don't know where it is going to be tomorrow. And, and this sort of, you know, are the people who are making some of these ridiculous decisions, are they making them because they want to make money? Are they making them because they're stupid? Or are they making them because they're working for Russia? Or is it actually all three at the same time? I, I, the answer is I don't know. But, but what it does in terms of looking at NATO is it gives the people outside that NATO a really difficult time of understanding who and what is Ukraine at the moment. Uh, it's, it's really difficult. And so, and it, not helped by the fact that the diplomatic system is as it is. And so it tends to have to work with government uh, rather than civil society to a large degree. Uh, and, and because they're working with government, they have to deal with government and they have to smile, shake hands, go to cocktail parties and be nice to people, even though they don't understand who or what that person is that they're dealing with. Uh, I mean, and, and I'm going to say Poroshenko was a prime example of that. Um, people really didn't understand him. Um, and this, this, in the wider sense, this is, a, this is problematic for NATO because um, you've got three points with NATO that you can look at. Joining NATO membership, let's call it NATO membership, getting to map. Uh, and by the way, I've done, I've worked with four membership action plan processes. Estonia, which I wrote the first one actually physically wrote it. Latvia, which I worked a part of. Montenegro, where I helped them with the white paper before NATO and, and, and wrote large chunks of it with them. Uh, and, and Northern Macedonia, which was then Macedonia, by the way. Um, the North came afterwards. Uh, and th there's three points there with, with these things. The first one is that, that NATO expects countries that work with it to look at reality. This is because the Western group lead and the Western group are a reality, have a reality fixation. America, US, uh, America, UK, France. So they expect reality. They don't want wishy-washy nonsense. They want, they want people to be up front and to say it and to look at it and to understand what they're looking at. And you can see that from the fact that, that uh, America is, is in Ukraine. Britain has been doing quite a lot of training and did a parachute jump down near Odessa some weeks ago. So the reality bit is there. The second bit is there is always the need for truth. Uh, and that truth is really, really important. That, that when you write something in the membership action plan, when you write something in your documents, that should be true. Because that goes back to the reality part. So reality followed by the truth of it are, are fundamentals to to NATO membership, their fundamental values. And then the third bit is, is that you do what you say you're going to do. Now, you could say, well, OK, there are countries that are not doing that at the moment. And that is true. I, and I'm sh shame them, Bulgaria. 
um, which has not delivered on its promises time after time after time. But Bulgaria was brought into NATO at a time when it was a political move. And therefore, it's still a political move. And there is an understanding that Bulgaria may take longer than everybody to finally come to its senses and actually get things right. But I'm not sure at the moment that the next round, be it Georgia and uh, hopefully Georgia and, uh, and Ukraine, that the politics will over, overtake completely the military part. Because with Ukraine, the politics are unclear. If there was clarity in the politics, people would accept the military bit as being shit. They would accept it because we've done that before. If they believe that everybody is right and honest, they'll accept rubbish and try and sort it out afterwards. But when the politics is unclear and the military is not good, then everything is not good. And that then becomes a bigger problem for everybody. Is America and uh, America and Great Britain capable of sorting out the mess? And at the moment, I would have to say, no, they're not. Um, and therefore, this is going to back onto a Ukraine problem. The Ukrainian society, that, that third leg of the problem, the pro-members of society, have to sort this out themselves. And at the moment, the pro part of society, the pro NATO, is extremely quiet and placid and only writing on Facebook. Now, I'm not saying they've got to do another Maidan, but they've got to be political. Because if they're not political, all the nice words of uh, the NATO liaison office and everybody else will go nowhere. Because the Russian side of trying to keep NATO out, the, the, the hybrid warfare side, is actually winning at the moment is getting stronger. So that is my sort of thesis as it is at the moment. Uh, Thank you, Blair. Uh, who wants to speak up next or maybe can I comment on it? Irakli, maybe you want to... Oh, okay, George. Go on, please. Okay, thanks, uh, Natalia. So um, I think I would mainly uh, or entirely agree with both Yulia's comments and Glenn's comments and maybe even amplify them. And I'll defer to them in terms of expertise uh, from a NATO long-term NATO organizational perspective, the specifics of the different nation countries and from Yulia's uh, experience dealing directly with Russia and all the history with that. A lot of my comments are a little bit more big picture, but also specific to my observations and dealing with specific people sort of on the ground quite a bit involved with the conflict and, and both uh, militarily and, 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 and activist roles. Uh, let, let me give it the big picture the way I see it. Uh, and I think everybody in the call would agree with this. Uh, Russia is a, a direct uh, existential threat to Ukraine. Uh, Russia attempts to be an existential threat to Europe and even the United States and the world, and at least pretends to be so, uh, but I, I believe actually is. Uh, dealing with Soviet or Russian aggression, in fact, is the very purpose of NATO. So I would say that uh, what Ukraine does with respect to NATO is, was actually inevitable that we would get to this point if the historical trajectory was going to go in a certain way. And I would say that because of its geographic location and historical connection with Russia, uh, and its military experience and platform sharing and things like that, uh, Ukraine is not just inevitable, but also indispensable if, if NATO is a serious organization. Uh, this may be the biggest question of NATO membership in the history of NATO, because that the original allies of World War II would join together <clears> was a <throat> foregone conclusion. But the getting to the Ukraine question now really starts to ask some big questions of NATO. Uh, I see this, as many people do, as an era of new great power competition. Uh, this is uh, democracy and freedom and rule of law versus despotism and surveillance and corruption. Ukraine is right in the middle of that. And uh, Ukraine losing the war here is a very bad data point for that big global challenge. And why does that matter? Uh, the biggest problem to be solved, as uh, Joe Citizen here, is the climate problem. That's going to require cooperation. We have a big climate change problem. Uh, we have a big biodiversity problem. And uh, aside from all the other uh, inefficiencies and moral problems with despotism, we, we are not going to get ourselves out of this uh, planetary mess unless we can all work together. Um, Russia is constantly attacking all the NATO nations, many other nations, and in my opinion, actually actively engages in war. 
Uh, this is a hybrid type war to a new definition. Uh, the two biggest targets, from my view, are Ukraine and the United States, my country. Uh, Russia has committed, in my opinion, uh, what should be defined, at least in some perspective, as acts of war, the most obvious being interference with uh, the 2016 U.S. Presidential, uh, presidential election and a lot since then. Uh, in my view, the Ukrainian conflict uh, or war, that is the Russian war against Ukraine, is a war against colonial empire, uh, not a whole lot different from the American Revolution in some ways that history rhymes. Yeah. Uh, this is um, uh, war, This is also the war of independence against the Soviet Union. Uh, my country had big advantages of oceans and British democratic principles that Ukraine unfortunately doesn't have. Uh, I also have seen this um, as some student of history, uh, the current conflict, uh, the invasion of Crimea uh, was basically hitting the play button. Uh, the pause button had been pushed previously in Crimea and Yalta in February 1945 with agreements about the division of Europe and spheres of influence. And the uh, I don't know if it's an irony, but the rhyming history of the invasion of Crimea setting everything back into play again with the continuation of the middle 20th century conflict uh, is interesting, of course, and almost forces the strategic uh, realization and understanding of how Ukraine is in the middle of all of this. Um, the significance of Ukraine, as I said, I think is huge. Uh, it is the biggest single fear of Vladimir Putin, in my opinion, uh, that Maidan spreads to other post-Soviet states uh, happening maybe in Belarus, Moldova, lots happening in Georgia, uh, and most of all to Russia itself. Uh, this is happening now. It's the war for Europe and Ukraine is, let's say, the flame on the fire. Other parts aren't burning, but Ukraine is actually the part with the hottest part of the flame. Uh, these are the two largest countries in Europe. Uh, Ukraine was the other country of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is a test bed for the future of war. Obviously, uh, it's a big deal, a war across a full spectrum. Uh, the uh, fear of the Kremlin of Ukraine is pretty clear. The language, cultural, family histories uh, make it possible for Ukraine to influence Russia from the inside and to engage the Russian population, which is the biggest fear of all for those looking to retain power in Russia. Uh, to my understanding, Ukraine is the largest democratic Russian-speaking country in history uh, and is the key possibly to influencing change in Russia from the inside. Uh, just a couple other things about why Ukraine is significant. The 1710 uh, Zaporozhian Constitution was the first in the world to uh, sort of outline the principles of government we all use today. This was uh, quite a bit before this was done in France or the United States or in Poland. Um, and uh, I think that Ukraine offers a process for integration and inclusion of other NATO members that have conflicts and problems. And this is obviously Georgia, but also Belarus, uh, Moldova uh, coming up with some issues, maybe Armenia and lots of other countries. Um, what, what does Ukraine have to offer NATO? A lot of experience fighting a war with Russia, uh, fighting a hybrid war with Russia, uh, knowledge of Russian weapon systems and Soviet platforms, uh, troubleshooting improving NATO systems and fighting a conflict with Russia, uh, understanding the Russian war fighting philosophy, the culture, the methods, uh, which Americans aren't so good at understanding. It's a different way to street fight, so to speak. Uh, and Ukraine has very good low cost platforms. Ukraine can help in this global policing role, also with uh, a lot of uh, soldiers, uh, lots of good technology and lower cost platforms. Third largest uh, military in Europe with 250,000 people after Russia and France. And so I think there's a huge amount to offer and even more. And by the way, they're already at five and a half percent, I think, of GDP for military expenditures. Uh, what's happening now that's big or relevant, especially, well, we have a new administration in the United States, probably the best one for this discussion in terms of helping Ukraine since maybe George Bush Sr. was president. So it's an opportunity for what we would say in America, game on, uh, if, we're, if this is going to get real. Uh, everything about Minsk hasn't been working. U.S. should get involved in that. Uh, that needs to move somewhere else to Vilnius or something. Uh, Russia is overextended now and has been for a long time. Oil, gas prices, the ruble, and too many conflicts. Um, Ukraine's biggest problem is division from the inside, in my opinion. And uh, this has been a danger historically to the country and remains a big danger. I think that both of the other panelists alluded to this. So I would say the timing is now. Planning, communication, resourcing, action, and this will take some time. Official membership doesn't matter so much as doing the right things. And then whatever it's called, uh, that's also important. But uh, I don't think anybody in Europe, well, not anybody, but I think many of the NATO countries won't agree to getting into the Third World War on behalf of Ukraine, but they can be nudged in, in that basic direction of supporting Ukraine more and not 
defaulting on this very simplistic, almost childish rule that because Ukraine is fighting the very country for which Ukraine, ha- for which NATO has this reason for being, therefore they can't be a member. Same applies to Georgia, by the way. And doing nothing is a green light for more interference in Ukraine and elsewhere. So the things that I'd like to say just very briefly, um, there needs to be an, a public education plan for the people in Ukraine to understand about NATO. Uh, NATO has uh, got 70 years of dinfor- disinformation associated with it. It needs to be rebranded. It maybe needs to be renamed. Uh, but there is uh, uh, right now, uh, as I understand it, it may be true that uh, the typical Ukrainian person, not the fault of their own, just because of disinformation over 70 years, might be more afraid of NATO than of Russia. Uh, and this, again, deals with the divided country threat. So the, the public, there needs to be a real program to educate the public because this is really being done for their lives and going to have big effects on them to show the benefit of what this would uh, of joining of, of membership and alignment with NATO would be and what benefits of reforms are, et cetera. Um, uh, let's see a few other things. Uh, uh, yeah, the strategic plan that NATO needs to put together has to be multi-domain, leverage to cross countries and conflicts. Uh, it needs to get a lot of critical mass. It needs to be much more uh, offensive, and it needs to be opportunistic. Um, in terms of what Ukraine should do, in my opinion, and talking with people involved in this area, I'm not a total expert, but I would say that uh, reforms of military leadership in Ukraine, of enlisted and junior officers, how that happens, it's a business uh, case even of just organizational change, attrition, recruitment, replacement, uh, training. And uh, then Ukraine needs to put its best foot forward to show what best practices and personnel and weapon systems and elite groups it has and technologists and specialists to bring to NATO. There's a big value added that Ukraine can add that the Western powers, uh, NATO and uh, my country and many of the other ones, as Glenn mentioned, uh, what the UK is doing, there's a lot of value to bring. It's already been identified, but that should be done very systematically. Um, As I understand, there's legal reforms necessary to do NATO compliance, judicial reforms, and then there's the whole political system also in dealing with everything else that actually does have NATO impact. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate what I said. This business of Ukraine aligning with NATO is probably the biggest single concern of Putin, separate from a Maidan in Russia. Uh, And then about Russia, the response will be guaranteed. It'll be more of the same. Uh, And NATO needs to be ready and Ukraine needs to be ready with counter responses and counter counter responses. And my opinion is very strong, just from a strategic point of view, that the time is passed for being passive and being reactive. Uh, The NATO side of this, the Ukraine side of this needs to use surprise, take the offense, don't announce, play some of the street rules that Russia plays by, deny and destabilize and take the offense on this. Um, Final points. Um, uh, Ukraine has a lot of leverage on what they can bargain with, and they haven't played hardball. Uh, Ukraine was, uh, in my opinion, obviously violated by Russia with the Budapest Memorandum, but also let down very much by the other countries that were signatories, U.S., uh, U.K., France. That really needs to be looked at again as, as to what happened with that agreement. In my opinion, Ukraine could legitimately say that they want to be a nuclear power, not that they would want to be, but as a bargaining chip because that agreement was violated. Uh, Ukraine can be a global weapons supplier to even non-NATO friendly nations. Uh, They can be a threat to Eastern Europe. Uh, If Ukraine does not join and move in the direction of NATO in the West, then things will be a lot harder for Georgia, Moldova, Belarus, and lots of other countries. Uh, Ukraine has the capability to be a very nefarious IT, cyber, and disinformation uh, operator if they wanted to. And so Ukraine should play hardball with NATO to get NATO to come around by saying, we're going to operate according to our own self-interest. We want to be a free country, and we're going to do it with or without you. And they haven't really played that card because they've been afraid of losing uh, the Western allies. Uh, final comments. Uh, the, the whole t- economic situation needs to be forced with Russia mm-hmm. on, on many fronts. And the last thing is Germany has a big role in this, and there should be some type of German Marshall Plan. And I would see Germany taking a very big role in this, in addition to the classic sort of Western allies that uh, Glenn uh, defined. Thank you, George. And uh, now I suggest we hear the Georgian perspective to this scene. Heracli, your floor, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. If I am allowed, I will have a speech in Russian. Uh, 
and it will be translated into English. Uh, first of all, I would like to stress out that the situation around NATO membership uh, of Georgia and Ukraine can change rapidly. Uh, we can uh, take the example of Georgia. Since 30 years, Georgia is moving towards NATO membership. We have implemented uh, many recommendations and requirements. Uh, NATO has supported Georgia a lot in a, uh, in a empowerment, uh, uh, in the capacity building and training. And Georgia was one of the biggest contributor uh, contributor in NATO uh, peace building operations, peacemaking operations. And uh, Na uh, Georgia was equipped according to all NATO standards. But what can we see? Unfortunately, the more time goes by, the more disappointed the people are. Those are the people who voted for NATO membership, and it was more than 70% of all population, of all voters. Um, these people are just tired of so it, you can see, you can tell that the people are just tired of waiting. They are just uh, waiting for the uh, membership of Georgia in NATO. So you must take this into account. 30 years is not a joke. While our uh, friends from Baltic lands succeeded very quickly within only a couple of years. Yes, there are some problems which we have both in Georgia and in Ukraine. Those are, for example, the problems of the judiciary, uh, elections, uh, corruption. So there are many unresolved issues we need to address. So this is not a, uh, there, there, there can be no doubt about it. But uh, speaking about an external threat, when both Georgia and Ukraine declared officially that their strategic goal is NATO membership and EU membership. These uh, causes great aggression from Russian Federation. And it grows bigger. Uh, uh, and the more we want to join NATO and the EU, the more aggression from Russia we get. The uh, latest events in Caucasus region have shown us clear enough that Russia is implementing a very aggressive policy towards South Caucasus, towards Ukraine, and concerning uh, so there is only one uh, country in Caucasus region where uh, there were no Russian aggression. This was a Azerbaijan. And today it is clear enough uh, there was a deal between two players, Russian, Russia and Turkey, um, regarding Karabakh conflict. And all of a sudden, uh, Russia uh, shows up there. And today, Georgia is one of the pro-NATO states in South Caucasus is surrounded by Russian military bases. Even though 
in Azerbaijan, we can hear uh, some unhappy uh, messages because Russian military forces, uh, they uh, beat the number, they outnumber uh, the military the military forces of the peacemaking troops. So they outnumbered the negotiated amount of uh, troops and military equipment in Nagorno-Karabakh. So it is clear enough that the peacemaking troops from Russia can turn into a military base in Azerbaijan, which, which was the case in Skivali and Tsukhumi, so those uh, occupied territories of Georgia. So in Azerbaijan, uh, they uh, understand it, and in NATO, they also realize it. If we uh, see uh, the uh, statement of Alexander Beshbo, the former state secretary, he uh, stated that Georgia and Ukraine should be as soon as possible um, provided by uh, provided with a mechanism of something like associated membership in NATO to be able to defend this so sovereignty of these uh, States uh, Ben Sojas, former leader of a European group of the North Atlantic Alliance, uh, General Ben Sojas, he declared that Georgia shall be shall become NATO member as soon as possible because there is a realistic danger that the NATO can possibly lose control, lose influence uh, in South Caucasus, which gives us great hope. Uh, that the administration of the newly elected president uh, Joe Biden um, Anthony Blinken Anthony Blinken has the position of state secretary this is a clear uh, message he he makes a clear message that uh, support for both of our states shall be strengthened. And Alexander Beshpo also uh, recently declared that Belarus, Belarus, Belarus needs uh, support as well. So this is how the situation looks like. Um, so as uh, I already mentioned, we have done many things and we also have uh, some challenges we are facing and sometimes we must face these challenges on our own. I hope that NATO will make a decision in the nearest future to maybe more actively participate in uh, the situation around our countries and support Georgia and Ukraine in uh, their on their way to NATO membership and hopefully we will uh, achieve this goal soon enough but as I already mentioned there are many problems uh, we have occupied territories and Ukraine has occupied territories so uh, 2008, this was the reason why we rejected NAP. This was what I wanted to say, and hopefully things will change for the better uh, with the new administration and uh, with uh, our more active contacts with NATO. Thank you very much. It's uh, so pleasant to hear at least some optimism uh, from you. Uh, who wants to comment on uh, those statements, Glenn or Yulia? 
I, I, I can some remarks, a few remarks. Uh, thank you, all of the speakers. Um, this, uh, uh, mess your messages were very um, important for understanding the NATO uh, future, the future of the relationship between our countries, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, and uh, all over the world with this organization. Uh, I want to um, uh, to give you some remarks for George, for example, about the sociology, about the education uh, and um, uh, informational campaigns about in Ukraine about NATO. For example, we have a data, official data uh, on the Ukraine Forum uh, website that, for example, in uh, 2019, uh, we had um, uh, 76% uh, who support NATO uh, in Donbass, uh, it is 37 uh, in the um, northern part of Ukraine, 66. In the eastern part uh, is 55% uh, uh, of the, our population. Uh, so it was very important that from uh, 2012 uh, till now, uh, the increasing of uh, support in NATO is uh, uh, more than uh, 46%. Uh, so Ukraine uh, now uh, had uh, from from uh, 2000 uh, um, maybe 13 uh, had a huge com informational campaign uh, in supporting with um, uh, NATO office uh, center of documentation and information of NATO, uh, all of the representatives of NATO, not only through the military uh, people from, uh, uh, but also through the civil society, through uh, students, uh, youth, and so on. Uh, one more remark is uh, to. Um, uh, those uh, things that uh, told us uh, Iraqli. I uh, support uh, his words that uh, we really not uh, the ideal of state, or we are young democracy, uh, young democracies, and not so many things are maybe so good in our country. We had some pro problems, corruption. We have some other uh, things, uh, the not so uh, so strong uh, steps uh, to reform our economy and so on. But now all over the world uh, faced with the geopolitical challenge. And in these um, points, we can, we can define what is more important to support geopolitical uh, challenge of uh, European civilization with the, the European values, or to, uh, to be very, uh, very strong in uh, achieving, in assessing of our achieving some uh, reforms, processes, and so on. It, it can be a situation, but it will not be a possibility to make a reforms because it will be crucial geopolitical uh, counteraction and war. So it's my remarks. Thank you, Yulia. And probably uh, Glenn wants to step uh, in uh, this conversation because I think it's his favorite topic. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I sympathize with Iraqli's comment about 30 years of, uh, of waiting. Uh, and and uh, an awful lot of pe members, people in NATO who are not political, who are military, uh, who've served alongside Georgians in, in operations all, all over, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and, and other places, uh, sympathize equally well. Um, and, and actually find it quite difficult to understand why, why Georgia hasn't been accepted already. Um, and I certainly, uh, I certainly you, can, you can pass on to the MFA when you go back, Iraqli. I think you should all be members of NATO. But I think there's a wider bit than this, which is, which is about the, um, you could call it the post-Soviet world, because it's quite clear to me that, 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 that the two best tools that we have for beating the post-Soviet world are NATO and the European Union. Um, and, that, 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 you know, when you combine the two of them uh, it, effectively, then you get, you get dynamic change and you get improvement. It does take time. There's no question about it. But you do get improvement in, in, in everything, in the life. And, and being here in Latvia, uh, uh, in Riga, I can see that. And I can see that the, the benefits of the 
the benefits of, of, of both organizations, how they gradually help people move from uh, post-Soviet or from Soviet into post-Soviet and then into, you know, European ways of, of being and, 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 and living. So I think it's really important that, that, that for, 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 for both Ukraine and for Georgia, that, that both of those aims should not be sort of delinked one from the other. But actually, it's the two of them together that create the, 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 the fundamental drive. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, the European Union bringing with it Erasmus and the exchange of, you know, the exchange of academics and the exchange of students makes a huge, huge change, um, which, which, of course, Erasmus is not an immediate change. It's, it's a fundamental long term change over 20 or 30 years. But, you know, but, but, but things like that are, are absolutely vital, um, which is why it, it, it beholds the government to actually to try and do the things that it needs to do to get into both of these organizations to do them properly. And why at the same time, Russia is going to fight hard to make sure that, that, that Ukraine and Georgia don't get into, into these organizations. Um, the shame with it, 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 with it, Ukraine at the moment is I just see no plan. I see no strategy and I see no plan other than Poroshenko's strategy of putting the things into the constitution. But we know now, you know, actually the constitution doesn't actually make much difference, does it? Um, you know, people just ignore it. Uh, so I think that, that, you know, there needs to be a plan. And, and I go back to my civil society bit that, you know, it's people in civil society might have to write it if the government won't. Uh, and, and this this brings another thing, you know, a, a whole new level of, of thinking. Thank you, uh, Glenn. We have a uh, questions from our audience. Sergei Petrov asks, uh, uh, that is a question to Irakli, why, uh, the, well, I don't know whether, uh, 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 whether, uh, do you think that uh, the NATO uh, management, the headquarters of NATO, whoever uh, managing NATO, uh, will ever understand the threat that Russia uh, poses not only to our regions, but to the whole world? Is there any, uh, well, idea or, or any, uh, do, do we have any hopes that NATO will understand and accept the uh, gravity of a threat of Russia? It's a question from Sergei Petrov to Irakli, but I think uh, maybe not only Irakli, but other people can answer. Well, I, have a, I have a comment on that. Yeah, sure, sure. But l l let us give floor to Irakli first. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to say that NATO is not an organization that is against somebody. It is an organization that is based on the human freedoms and sovereignty of states and defense of the sovereignties and human values, defense of human values. It's an organization that is not against anybody at all. Uh, the thing is that the politics of today's Russia is aggressive towards all of its neighbors and not just neighbors. Is I think everybody understands that. It's It goes without saying, really. As for our countries, again, our countries are are not actually all that much into becoming the member of NATO to be against Russia, but they want to become members of NATO to protect ourselves. Think about Sergei's question. There is no other answer that, then, of course, 
the danger of the aggression behavior of the state people perceive it people understand it just like how can there be any other opinion if ukraine and georgia both have occupied territories 20 percent of georgia is occupied and donbas is occupied and the crimea is annexed thank you say something Sorry, what did you say? Uh, I, I, you wanted to uh, comment on yeah, this? Yeah, yes, I do. Please. I mean, I, I think that the, the point, actually, in a way, that the question misses the point, because, I mean, there is no NATO headquarters in that respect. It's a, it's a collection of nations. So when you get down to it, what you've got to ask is, you know, does each nation recognize that Russia is a threat? And then you've got to say, well, nations are not actually homogenous organizations. They're made up of politicians. And, and so at any one time, you might have a collection of politicians uh, in a particular country who are either being paid or supported by Russia and who don't see Russia as a threat. And at times like that, then, you, you know, like Hungary at the moment, you actually end up with a nation that is or a government, not, not society, but a government that is pulling away in this respect. Um, you, you could say that, that you know, that if, if you're going to talk about NATO in, in terms of its, uh, as an organization, then you're almost like going back into the, into the Pentagon and State Department and asking whether the undersecretaries of state there actually see Russia as a threat. Because if the undersecretaries of state in Pen uh, undersecretary of state in the Pentagon and State Department see Russia as a threat, then trust me, the money will go. Congress will follow that, and the money will actually direct things. And you will get American support in Europe. You'll get American troops in Europe. So these things are very actually people dependent, and because they're people dependent, the big part of the hybrid war for Russia as we know directly from, from Trump and his colleagues, that the big part of the hybrid war is to buy off as many politicians as possible. Uh, and, and, you know, even countries that, that, that are right up hard against Russia, like, like Estonia, they have problems. And they have problems, you know, with, with, with Russia trying to actually, you know, but, but browbeat and bully and buy off politicians. So this is a constant, this is a constant battle. So when someone says, you know, do people ever understand Russia? The answer is, yeah, most people do. But, but, but Russia's fighting back hard against that every single day and every hour. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Uh, and, uh, I'm trying to yeah, tell yeah, you. Yeah, Please so just to add, and, uh, I have a quick question, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Do you see the questions and uh, questions in the chat, or should I uh, voice them? I think you should oh. voice them. I, okay, I don't see okay. them on my screen. Okay, so George, uh, go on, and we have a question to you. Uh, okay. How critical is military cooperation of Turkey as a NATO member and uh, for Ukraine uh, and Ukraine for uh, for Ukraine and Russia and so on? Please. Uh, I would say it's not the most critical, but of course it's extremely critical um, because mm -hmm. of re the, just the regional, um, the, the Black Sea region, and Turkey is, I think, the fifth biggest military in the world. Uh, really, uh, for stability in the region, there has to be cooperation between Turkey and Ukraine. It's essential. Uh, Turkey is moving in an interesting direction in terms of uh, uh, its strong leader, and uh, but that's for a different discussion. But um, there's a natural alignment of Ukraine with Turkey especially given Russia in the north and the history of the Ottoman Empire and the history in Ukraine. Um, I want to just address briefly Yulia's comment about the, uh, the positive uh, or impression of NATO within Ukraine. I I'm aware of the numbers. I wasn't aware it was so high as in the 70 percent. When I've said that to people here that I speak with, they've said to me, no, nope, you need to do more. People don't understand enough. They're sort of blowing in the wind. Um, and that there needs to be more education. And they've also mentioned in the political realm, specifically even to educate politicians about what NATO, what NATO actually does. Um, <clears throat> and then to go to um, what, what about the, the other question was a very important one about uh, will NATO, uh, as Glenn rightly said, isn't really a, a person or a specific group. It's a, it's a very dis, uh, disparate entity. 
But um, the problem with understanding Russia in my country is I would say most people don't understand. Uh, in Europe, maybe there's more understanding among the intelligentsia. For sure, there's understanding. In my country, uh, it's pretty bad. Um, I, my fear is that if we don't educate, because this rule of educating or, or the, the objective of educating people in Ukraine has a corollary also to educate people in NATO countries and in the West, including in my country, very desperately, um, that uh, things have to get really bad and we have to have something catastrophic or really bad happen for people to react. Uh, right now, we're in a void. Hopefully, the Biden administration will start to do a better job of getting to the truth and uh, what, what Russia is really doing. I think a lot of people are very confused. Um, so there's a lot of work to do there, and it's very dangerous. And I would say that that's one of the most important areas uh, to focus on is this whole communication of what NATO does, what Russia is doing, and what the truth is. Um, anyway, so, so those are my comments. Thank you, George. I want to uh, emphasize that 70 uh, percent uh, is uh, well average on all Ukraine. But uh, I live in Kharkiv, and George mostly visits Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, this and such regions. And the support of NATO in these regions is substantially lower. And I absolutely support everything uh, what George uh, had just said. It's uh, we should not be uh, much relying on averages. We should. Uh, uh, I have some remarks. Yeah, sure. I have, I have some remarks. Uh, thank you about previous question. Previous question was, uh, as for me, very important uh, because uh, it is really a question who understand the role of uh, Russia and the threat of Russia. And I agree with Glenn about the different levels of understanding national level in the countries, political level and so on. But I have a little experience when we uh, had a consultations with uh, NATO experts in hybrid warfare, for example, and we uh, try to uh, try to highlight that Ukraine uh, now is on the front line of this uh, hybrid warfare. And Russia use and uh, use different uh, manipulative technologies. And today's Ukrainian experience in this field is unique. And maybe uh, we need to uh, more to share this experience with NATO countries because uh, these countries uh, didn't um, didn't face with so much uh, informational. Uh, military aggression as we are and it is very important for ukraine to uh, share and to um, deliver this information to the nato experts and it will be very important for us uh, if these experts will listen to us but uh, because in different cases they even uh, say oh it's really it's impossible how the russia can do operate uh, uh, Something like this, we can uh, when we gave the evidences, and uh, uh, not every even military experts understand this. So it's very important to make understandable mm -hmm. for uh, European and NATO members um, uh, about this uh, information about hybrid warfare and using Ukrainian experience in counteraction. Uh, about education, uh, it's also my uh, little remark. I fully agree with uh, George and with you, Natalia, that uh, education and uh, not only education about NATO, education about current threats, about informational threats, about uh, uh, media grammar, uh, about uh, how to um, protect uh, ourselves from the uh, fake news, from disinformation is very important. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question uh, to Glenn uh, via YouTube uh, stream commands. The question says, does NATO has a strategy of working with civil society? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, but I think it's, it's, you might say it's, it's, it's in a hybrid stage um, because we do actually, we, I mean, we have a communications um, uh, communications part in the in the NATO liaison office, and and the NATO liaison office does try and work hard with running courses for for teaching young leaders, um, and I've been a lecturer on a couple of those, um, and and uh, generally taking NATO out to the regions and and doing things, but but this is it, it's um you could say it's quite a new thing to do that. I mean we've always had uh, we've always had CIMIC 
uh, civil military relations when we're working on operations and that's always a big part of operations but but in many ways n ukraine is not a nato operation <clears throat> so we don't have all the energy of the of the uh, or the skills of the simic people here in 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 ukraine um so in afghanistan yes lots in iraq yes lots in ukraine less because it's not an operation Okay, and what should uh, what I, can, I have, should I, we do? I have. I can clarify a little bit. Uh, NATO has a very strong instrument for influence in hybrid warfare. It's strategic communication, which includes uh, uh, cooperation with media, uh, cooperation with civil society, and uh, informational psychological operations. And we also try to implement this NATO instrument. Uh, in uh, our uh, uh, hybrid warfare, and it's it's very effective as I see. But really, I agree with Glenn. We are not member uh, of NATO, uh, but it uh, uh, don't uh, have don't uh, permit us to uh, it it permit us to use the technologies. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who wants to comment more, George Irakli? Any more comments? Uh, well, I can throw off another ball if you would. Uh, well, uh, what can or should we, as a civil society organization, for example, the organization which I represent, which is a co-organizing of this forum, Maidan Monitoring Information Center, which has uh, Ukraine uh, full membership in NATO as a, in an our mission statement. So it's an, uh, our objective, we voted for it, all of our members and so on. So what, in your opinion, can we, or other uh, civil society organization do uh, because uh, Glenn said that we are not doing enough, we are not visible. What, what can we do to influence uh, internal and external situation? May I? Uh, so I'll uh, try to be brief on this. Uh, what's interesting is that your organization is a social intermediary organization dealing with communication with civil society and other groups. Uh, this is a discussion about a strategic military organization. So the content of that discussion, the related education to that, is still significantly of a military strategic content and is going to sort of drill down uh, in the full spectrum of what it means to be in hybrid war and disinformation and cyber and then different uh, weapon system and a different experience. And so to go back to what Yulia had said, uh, Ukraine has a unique role and this, this is what has to be communicated and understood because of Ukraine is actually the country that has the most experience in this current period fighting an actual war with Russia using a lot of very advanced technology that, according to Minsk, they shouldn't even be using. Uh, this is the hi it's hybrid war. It's electronic war. It's, it's new weapon platforms. Um, and the uh, what has to be understood within NATO, and I think as Glenn had alluded, some of the countries are more interested, some are less interested. I think there has to be a lot of education even within NATO itself and these different member groups as to what the actual benefits would be to NATO. There's many benefits aside from economic benefits and having a, a partner that's defending Europe. There's actually a very significant war fighting benefits that can be gained by NATO if they can engage even more fully with Ukraine. Uh, and, and this would be very synergistic. Um, so I don't know where your organization, Talia, fits right into that, but there's a lot of different levels of communication and education that have to occur here and lots of dialogue that has to happen to fully explore what I would call the opportunity space of Ukraine in NATO. I've got a lot more notes here. I've been a lot of thinking about this since you and I had talked. And I, I believe um, in the same way that it's essential and critical uh, it, it also, when you drill down into this, you see enormous possible opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I'm on the outside, and the professionals that live with this and work with it probably would temper my enthusiasm by saying it's not so easy in the real world. But I, I think this is the time for optimism, for the big push, for resourcing, making the effort, really thinking, dialogue, some of it not so much fun, and sort of starting to, to, to work on this. Uh, to, to finally start to make some moves, uh, particularly also to go back to Iraqlian's comments that uh, George has also been waiting forever. And this is just taking a long time. And, and the longer it waits, the more it plays to Putin's hand. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I mean, I, I, I can't disagree with anything that George says there, but I'm just going to temper his enthusiasm slightly <laughs> by by just saying that, you know, the problem lies is that, that the, the majority of knowledge and information that you're talking about resides in the civil sector. It doesn't reside in the military. It's the, it's the activists who are taking that, those equipments that you're talking about to the front line. I mean, recently, the, 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 what they call the C4I system, which is cameras around the, uh, around the battlefield area, the, 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 the command and control system for that was closed by the minister. Now, you know, this is one of the most modern things uh, uh, that, 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 that the country actually had. And there was, not only should it not have been closed, it should have been enhanced. And actually that, you know, the system improved and, and, and made better because it was something that was actually really fundamentally good. I mean, you know, I was able to go in there and watch uh, a separatist tank driving down the road. Uh, 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 and see it fire a couple of rounds at the uh, 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 at our troops. Um, now, you know, that's a marvellous thing to be able to have and see. Um, and you don't want to close that. So this civil sector thing, the civil society people in general, the NGOs collectively know all the things that you're talking about. But the NGOs are not in the system. They're not in the Ukrainian system and they're not in the Brit diplomatic system. So if you, an NGO wants to talk, it has to go and, you know, beg for time to talk to an ambassador. And a lot of times they don't get that time or they don't know who to start to talk to. So civil society is disenfranchised in many ways from the actual technical system of embassies, government. Uh, and so you've got embassies of government, then you've got civil society and military, frontline military. So the links are not uh, not coherent. Uh, and that's something that's actually got to be done because because if if civil society can't actually get that information over properly, it, it just doesn't get to NATO and doesn't mm -hmm. get to other countries. Because when people come in, they go via their embassy and then into the government system, mm -hmm. who then tell them what they want to hear. Because as you know, in Soviet Union, so in communism, it is not a lie to tell someone what they want to hear. And this is what you get. And this is what you can see. You can see it every day from the, the chief of defense and the minister saying what people want to hear, not actually what is true. And this takes me back to my original uh, talk about, you know, the, 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 the need for reality and truth. And it, civil society, my belief for, for, for Natalia, is you just got to keep hammering the system to start saying you've got to talk truth. And you've got to yep. you've got to talk reality, because those are the things that NATO wants to hear, and are the yeah. things of value. The actual, that's where the the money is, so to speak. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you uh, for your support and for your encouragement. And I absolutely agree with you that is the only thing we can do is to tell the truth, uh, only truth and nothing by the but the truth. Yeah, please, George. So I want to uh, sort of put this in a context of the support from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation to build specifically on Glenn's remarks. Uh, Natalia, you and your group have expertise in communications and networking and mapping these kind of things and understanding uh, dialogue and the breakdown of communication. And what Glenn has described, and I think what Yulia and Arakli were all describing, was the need for developing, uh, and the questions also from the viewers, to really start to resolve this uh, communications network and to find the parts where it's broken, uh, because some of this is a public education, some of it's political, a lot of it is just going to be basically a strategic and tactical uh, communication, but that a role for small money, maybe big money, but I would just say even for small money that the foundation could support your group on would be a sort of a communication uh, architect and consultant to really start to identify in, in sort of a process mapping a methodology uh, what the communication process would need to be, and where the, the uh, uh, where the breaking where the breaks are. Thank you, George. Thank you, and I hope that everyone can just register that we are not only speaking about our NGO. I just used it for the for an example, but our NGO is unique in the sense that we rather uh, protect our freedom to tell the truth than bend 
under well f- financial circumstances. Uh, unfortunately, most of NGOs do not have such uh, freedom. That is something mm. uh, which needs to be uh, considered as well. You know. Okay, who wants to speak up? Uh, maybe uh, uh, some other pa- panelists want to add something. Uh, I can add uh, some uh, a few, uh, not uh, questions, but maybe remarks about the role of NGOs. Uh, I think that in the in today's uh, warfare, uh, which has a hybrid elements, uh, manipulated technologies, disinformation, and so on. And uh, when we have uh, the um, uh, enemy who has a totalitarian uh, background and uh, a totalitarian model of management, it is a very important thing to create uh, net-centric structures. Uh, and NGO can inclu- can be included in this process, uh, can be uh, uh, like uh, uh, points of uh, uh, increasing the civil society cooperation. And uh, it is one of the ways to achieve resilience of the nation. And it's not only a problem of military or uh, civil, it's a problem of the state and society. And uh, in these uh, ways, we can be together. And also one of the main uh, state point in this thing is a trust to each other, to create a trust between civil society and state. This problem we have in our country. And uh, by the way, maybe it's our national, one of the national feature is not to, to, not to love our uh, government. <clears throat> but it, 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 it's maybe not only our feature, but uh, it exists in our country. And when we will, we will trust each other, when we will talk to each other with the truthful messages, I agree with Glenn, because truth is very important uh, to, to trust uh, ourselves, to trust um, state and government uh, and civil society. It's a very important thing. It, uh, in this process, civil society uh, can be very effective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, well, uh, of course, I agree and support you in it. Uh, however, uh, for many years uh, already we are trying to build such a connections and uh, well there are problems on both sides i would say unfortunately uh well ladies gentlemen do you have any more remarks uh well i wanted to put some last to the point is uh, that uh well there are only two females in this panel and there was another one in the first one and uh well i'm somehow feel not very comfortable about it because in my opinion uh, the presence of women in security in nato integration and in all those processes uh would seriously uh increase their efficiency what do you yeah. think <laughs> and how Ukraine copes with it actually because there are lots of uh, well lots of promises lots of uh, declarations signed about women peace and security and so on and so how do you think it's uh, being in reality Yulia is the first uh, well how to say it? I, I, general, I'm sorry. general, yeah. Who's a general. Yeah, the, the first general or acting general. Uh, second, in, uh, second, sorry, second, so, because we had oh, second. Uh, in our <laughs> yes, because we had our uh, medical service uh, manager uh, of security service. She was the yeah. first, but from the operational units and uh, such as the counterterrorist, the counterintelligence mm-hmm. units, uh, really first. Uh, if if it's possible, I can I can tell a few words about this, uh, and uh, maybe it will be my final remark. Uh, thank you that you highlighted this uh, question, uh, Natalia. Uh, really, uh, Ukraine has a national action, uh, action plan to uh, for the resolution uh, 1325. And uh, uh, now, uh, during this period to, from the uh, 2014 uh, when war uh, 
uh, began in our country. Uh, there were many um, changes in the army and uh, in the uh, law enforcement, uh, in police, and so on, which provides uh, an equal opportunities for uh, women and men uh, in service. And I think that it is a very um, important uh, step for uh, our country, because equal opportunities, it's also equal opportunities to defend our country. Uh, but uh, there are many uh, things which uh, are not now uh, which has not a decision in the field of uh, achieving equal opportunities, but uh, we have uh, fruitful cooperation with UN Women Organization and, uh, and other international organizations and NATO office also. And uh, the results that uh, some women has these positions in the army and uh, law enforcement, that many of uh, women have a possibility to um, achieve uh, their goals in different uh, technical uh, specialties, military specialties. It's also a step forward to uh, achieve uh, uh, values of uh, uh, democratic world to have an equal opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, anyone wants to comment, Glenn? George, oh, I think oh, just George. Bit before, yeah. I mean the the the, the work of the, um, uh, the the work of the ladies on the front line is outstanding, and and it's something that I constantly remind people um, that that you know that, that there is no question that in the military sphere, women have a, a serious part to play. I mean, we we know one thing is that 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 that, that women can actually take more G's. In aircraft, in, in planes, the men can. So you know they can actually turn tighter. They can turn a plane tighter. But these things, you know, the the the, the whole of the, the 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 gender thing will take time, because you know, I, no matter what you, I mean, Yulia is quite right in saying that you know there's a plan and everything else. But it's still a man's world, uh, in the military, yeah. in the police, and it will take a long time to to filter through and change. But it's got to, and it will. Um, no question about it. It will. Uh, but time is time is something that that just has to happen with this. Thank you, thank you, George. You wanted yeah. to say something? Yeah, I, I would uh, simply say that uh, I support your comments, uh, Yulia's comments, and Glenn's. Obviously, it's essential to have diversity in leadership. Um, and uh, gender diversity, probably the, the first one, but also racial diversity, diversity with uh, people with disabilities, uh, could be with uh, even a sexual preference. I, I'm from San Francisco area, so we're pretty open minded okay. about all of this. Our yeah. new vice president is a female and uh, she's from my part of the country. Uh, we've had two uh, women senators in California for a long time. And even in my industry, which is the construction industry, uh, the company that I do the most work with, which is Otis Elevator Company, the biggest in the world, has a woman as CEO. So we see big changes happening in the uh, private corporate sphere. I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, and, and Ukraine has, uh, I would say Ukraine is maybe 20 years different from the, where I'm living in Northern California, but these things change very fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what Ukraine does have that's quite interesting is a very diverse ethnicity going back to its sort of ancient DNA that maybe gives it a leg up in that Ukraine ends up being sort of a reflection of the future of Europe. If you take a cross section of Ukraine from uh, you know, north to south and east to west, you're going to find all sorts of DNA here. And it's a more mixed population, I believe, than I've ever seen in any country except maybe the U.S., but it's an ancient mixed population because of the convergence. In any event, I would I think that Ukraine is interesting also in that regard. But again, I want to I want to say that it's not just nice to do to incorporate women. Uh, it's essential. Uh, there's lots of lessons even from Afghanistan with American forces there of mistakes made not incorporating women to communicate with local population. And I think to Glenn's point, the more that that's explored, and I've had differences of opinion here in Ukraine from war fighters that tend to be more traditional, but um, the more that we explore both the things that women can do and maybe special things that women can do maybe different or better than men, uh, the more we're going to find out. And the best way to do that is just start doing it. So it's essential even to, for, for our countries to be true to what our values are supposed to be. I think it has to happen. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, Irakli, maybe you have some final remarks to say uh, or...
Я бы хотел сказать, я бы хотел поблагодарить очень. I would like to thank everybody because it's like very interesting. It was very interesting to listen to our speakers. A very, very important problems were raised, and I hope that the next year we will we'll be able to meet in real life in Kharkiv together, together, and have a nice conversation uh, all together. I thank you very much for your invitation. I'm honored to be part of this interesting, very interesting forum. Uh, that your words will come through and we will all meet together next year uh, and uh, thank everyone in participating and let me uh, quickly recap uh, the main message of top secret we i think learn together tell the truth stick to the truth do what you promise and everything will be okay am i right or not 100 <laughs> percent 